trash. Well, we've covered the first part of Sam Raimi and Rob Tappert's back-to-back -back action hour with Cleopatra 2525, which showed us that cleavage and bad effects can't make up for dull stories and wooden characters. But now let's take a look at the second part. What can I say about Bruce Campbell, I'm sorry, I mean Bruce freaking Campbell, that hasn't already been said by other internet reviewers better than me? The man is the epitome of cheesy awesome! Groovy. Yeah, I admit, I haven't actually seen Bubba Hotep or the Evil Dead movies. My indoctrination to Mr. Freakin' was as Autolycus the King of Thieves in Hercules and Xena. And of course, he stole the show in every episode he appeared in. Literally. When the Autolycus role ran its course, Tappert and Raimi allowed Campbell to co-produce and star in the second part of their action hour, Jack of All Trades. Did you think Hercules and Xena were bad in their ham-fisted acting and no realistic portrayal of history? Let me tell you, you haven't seen Jack! Oh, come on! Campbell plays Jack Stiles, a former Revolution soldier and now spy for President Thomas Jefferson in 1801. Jefferson assigns him to work undercover on an East Indian island under Napoleon's control as part of their effort to stop Napoleon's world conquest. And he wouldn't be better off sending him to France because... Anyway, he arrives on Pular Pular and meets his new partner, Emilia Rothschild, played by Angela Dochin. Cue the Dave and Maddie relationship! Yes. Your cover will be your livelihood as well. So tell me, is there a Mr. Stick in the Mud? Thanks to you, every French soldier in Pular Pular is on alert. You've made our job twice as hard, and do not, do not call me in. I can't resist. Well, excuse me, princess. Okay, she's not really a princess, but she's British and is on her high horse most of the time. Along with being a spy, Amelia is also an inventor, able to create 19th century versions of the submarine, the metal detector, and the electromagnet. <sighs> That's nothing. Wait until Emmett Brown arrives in Hill Valley in 84 years. And so Jack and Amelia's mission is to thwart the dastardly plans of the island's overly foppish governor, Croak. Get it? It's because the French are a bunch of frogs. But they still have to keep him in charge of the island because he might get replaced by someone corrupt but competent. Croak may be a swine, Jack, but he is a tolerable swine. If he were to die, Napoleon would unleash so great a fury on Palau Palau that our mission would be rendered impossible. That actually makes sense. Jack's plan to aid their efforts includes taking on another identity in the form of a masked bandit called the Daring Dragoon. We, the people of... Where are we again? Palau Palau. Palau Palau. In order to form a more perfect... island, demand an end to French imperialism. The episodes mainly involve using Amelia's inventions and covert tactics to undermine Croak, while Jack humiliates his captain, Brogard, as the Dragoon. Tag, you're in! So this show is essentially a mix of Xena, James Bond, and Zorro. How is this not the most awesome thing ever? As the Dragoon, Jack becomes the world's greatest swordsman who never actually stabs anyone. In fact, Brogard actually kills more of his own men than the Dragoon does. When I agreed to let you train with my men, Captain, I expected them back. Well, you know what they say, swords don't kill people, people kill people. Oh, and did I mention the theme song, which is also every level of awesome? And that's not just my opinion. That song was nominated for an Emmy. 
Okay, I guess you're tired of me glossing over everything and you want me to point out something bad about this series. Well, what's with all this about the U.S. trying to undermine the French government? I thought the French and Americans were on good terms due to their hatred of Britain. Wait, what's this about the quasi-war? Well, we have this ridiculous piece where the French actually lose Louisiana Purchase in a card game and... Wait, that also really happened? Wow, this show is actually getting some things accurate. That's kind of disillusioning. Oh, don't worry, we still have plenty of inaccuracies to point out, like Ben Franklin still being alive in 1801, the French offering the Statue of Liberty 85 years earlier, and the Dragoon beating the French at a football game. Beach, beach. That might be the stupidest rendition of a sporting event I've ever seen. The left fielder leaped high into the air. It's caught. Okay, okay, I take that back. Jeez, I just purged that image from my head. Really? You're really taking the Napoleon is short gag to the most ludicrous level? For the record, Napoleon stood about five foot six, which is taller than I am. What's next? Are they gonna cast Vern Troyer in that role? Uh, uh, Empire Napoleon. Shutting up, Rowdy. You really need to learn how to do it. Also, Pular Pular must be the center of the universe because it attracts the Marquis de Sade, Lewis and Clark, Catherine the Great, and King George III. And apparently they can all travel to and from the East Endings in no time. In the early 19th century. Yeah, and you thought Sidney Bristow being able to travel the globe was unrealistic. And what ultimately happens to Jack, Amelia, and their plans to stop Napoleon? We never find out because unlike Cleopatra, no finale was prepared when this show was canceled along with its partner. Jack of all trades has cheesy acting, bad action sequences, too many inaccuracies to count, and it's a whole bunch of fun. Yet this show has guilty pleasure written all over it. I think it actually might have done better had it been separate from Cleopatra 2525. It had a lot of the same things going for it that Hercules and Xena did, like the anachronistic jokes and the over-the-top characters with actual personality. Oh yeah, and it had Bruce freaking Campbell! Right on time, Nutcracker. So there you have it. Every once in a while, we might find a show that actually wasn't all that bad. Or at least is in the so bad it's good category. See you next time on TV Trash.